question is, what soundness, unsoundness issues that can you live with on club horses that you couldn't live with necessarily in a high school horse? Bow tendons, as long as they were treated correctly and healed correctly, and there's been a big advance in how therapy on bow tendons in the last five years than it was years and years ago. Um, it's great. The whole thing is to minimize scarring of the tendon. Tendons are elastic structures. They stretch like bungee cords. Olden times, when you tore some fibers, they scarred in. Scars don't stretch, so it's like cutting a couple pieces of the bungee cord straps and putting super glue in there and let them heal together. You'll never break the glue in the center of the glue. You'll break where the glue joins the old bungee cord fiber. And that's what bow tendons did. They, you lost some stretchability in them, and they tended to rebow. And in olden times, rebows, they tended to rebow 50% of the time, maybe even 60%. Depends on how big they are and their location. So now we try to get them. Then we went through splitting tendons, which is still pretty good. And that all that did is try to get blood vessels down into the area, drain the little serum pocket out, a little blood clot forms where the tear was, and drain that. Um, and get new blood vessels down in the t tendons take longer than bones to heal. You know, you break a bone, they'll say, oh, you're out three months. You, you bow a tendon, you're out a year. Because they have such poor blood supply and they're very slow to heal. So we started into splitting. And now we've gone from splitting, they came out with a matrix, a product called A cell that was made from pig's bladder that kind of formed a scaffolding that circulating stem cells in your body could stick to and help reform uh, elastic fiber. It worked okay. There were some flares. Um, and then they came, and then obviously where we are now is we use a lot of your own healing elements in your blood and your bone marrow, stem cells, growth factors, and platelets. We harvest those and concentrate them in small volumes and are able to put that in there and the body, they will become new tendon fibers. Never as good as before, but certainly way better than what we used to have. So that being said, what can you live with, the, what the point I was getting with, when you say I have an old bow tendon, it depends how it was treated on what you can live with and what you can't. You can live with, actually when these tendons heal up correctly, horses go back and compete and stay sound. Also there's a time element, obviously, just because we're doing the right thing to them, you still have to give it time to have it heal properly can't rush and shortcut. And also we're finding more and more conditioning is a good thing too. Instead of being out for eight months, maybe keep the horse out for three months, bring him up for 45 days, leg him up, then kick him back out. It, 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 it makes everything start pulling in the right direction. And the tensor strength of the new fibers healing in are, you know, vertical rather than sporadically intertwined like scars. And also keeps them from getting tremendously obese in the past year. So that little muscle conditioning and stuff. Some people tend to do it a, a lot through the course. But in polo and racetrack, lay aftercare on these tendons are much longer because we're going to a point of exhaustion versus a warm blood or dressage horse that's jumping and he's not getting he has if he ran lands wrong, maybe the impact, he could do something again. But he's not going to the point of exhaustion where his muscles aren't able to hold it. The tendons are merely extensions of the muscle to join. Tendons are joined muscle to bone, and ligaments join bone to bone. So these these muscles that hold the leg and the ankle up, when they fatigue and, and the forearm start, the ankle starts dropping, the tendon starts stretching. And that's why we we need to have maximal medical improvement on these tendons and reach the end point on where we know they're healed good, and we can go back in, regardless of what they look like on an ultrasound. But Club polo, when you say, oh, listen, I have this all the time. I'm selling a horse, he's got two bow tendons, and he's going to a minus one who's going to play four goal polo in Sun Valley. Well, that's good and bad. Like I said earlier, a lot of one goal, a minus one goal players may have a high school girl that doesn't really do a whole lot with horses other than she can ride on leg and keeping these horses fit. So, although he doesn't go as hard as maybe somebody that plays, you know, a number two or three in an eight goal polo or 12 goal polo, so the horse doesn't have that high load on it, <clears throat> that three goal player, an eight to 12 goal polo, can 
play a whole lot better. And, can, and, and he can condition a horse. He can use his horse when he needs to. He can make sure the horse is fit. He can monitor the tendons, how it's progressing. Is he getting a flare or anything else like that? Either. So yeah, that's, it's a double-edged sword. A lot of times with people that don't play, you know, they don't buy expensive horses. They try to scrimp on what their grooms, what they pay their grooms, how good of grooms they get. To me, the best thing on anything, whether it's ankles, whether it's hocks, whether it's tendons, is the groom, and does he have knowledge? Is he a pretty good leg man? I don't even care if he knows the difference between a, where the tendon is and where the suspensory is, as long as he feels the legs, flexes, goes through some basics, and lets you know about it. Most grooms, a lot of grooms can get frightened on telling the boss, hey, this horse is sore, hey, this horse is lame, so they kind of don't want him to know. He just wants to come to the barn, everything's okay. And then we end up with a pro little problem that becomes a big problem because nobody brought to anybody's attention. So, yes, you can get away with you can get away with stiff ankles that are have lost 35 percent of their flexion, an old knee fracture or chip, and the horse has lost 20 percent of the range of motion in his knee. Once they become dormant, a lot of times you can function good in low glow polo. You couldn't do it in high glow polo. And hocks, you can get away with a whole lot more in low glow polo. I mean, in logo polo, horses don't almost have to have back legs to play in polo. Because what we see, the first thing we see in polo, in high go polo, is horses don't want to stop when they're hawks hurt. They don't want to sit down. They want to keep on going. They start going through the bit, running. And the guy said, you know, he, he, put me to, you know, he leans on me because his hawks are sore. In logo polo, you can get away with that a lot. In high go polo, they know the horse is much more handy with their hawks. And they stop quicker and turn around, you know, and get away. Since we've changed the rule a little bit on turning on the ball, we get some of these horses that have batter hocks get to stay in high go polo longer than, than what we used to do when they were really want to check up and turn on the ball. But yeah, you can get away with a lot of problems in low go polo, but the big if in that is the quality of your group.